Um, this is George Jared. He's an investigative journalist. He graduated from Lyon College. Um, he wrote the book, Creekside Bones. I bought it last Friday night and had it read by Saturday morning. <laughs> so I enjoyed it. Um, I guess I enjoyed it. I shouldn't say that, but I enjoyed it. <laughs> so um, enjoy and listen, and afterwards he'll be selling books. And um, the ladies have some soups and different things made to enjoy afterwards. So listen, have fun. Don't get too cold. <laughs> Anything else? Thank you. Okay, I'll. Uh, I'm going to start off by telling you guys uh, a story, and um, this is Rebecca Gould. Um, she was a uh, college student in Northwest Arkansas, and on September 20th, uh, 2004, she vanished and uh, around a town called Melbourne. I'm sure you guys probably know where Izzard County's at. Okay, well, and the reason I'm telling this story, this is the first murder case I ever covered. And um, so she was missing for a week. No one knew where she was at. And um, about a week later, I, during this week of time between when um, the time we're talking about, I um, got to know her dad, her sisters. Um, they were out looking for her every day. Her dad's a prominent dentist in Mountain Home, really super nice guy. Um, she had three or four uh, uh, real cute sisters. In fact, the first time my wife actually went with me out to, you know, out with one of the search parties, she saw one of her sisters and she goes, I think I figured out why, you know, you're coming out here all the time. <laughs> and uh, so I, um, I was out looking for this, this girl every day. In fact, I've even still got the same notes I took the day that she disappeared. Um, right here on the back. Well, um, I was out uh, early one morning. Um, it was uh, September 27, 2004, and um, I decided to go to Melbourne. I was working at a newspaper in Salem. I had just graduated from college a couple years before that, and um, so I decided to go to Melbourne. And um, when I get to Melbourne, I see some ladies walking around the courthouse. And um, they were talking, and one lady uh, was telling the other lady, she said, you know, there's searchers out behind my house right now uh, because there's a smell, something's going on. So I asked the lady, I said, hey, where do you live at? Because I'd like to, you know, go out um, to see if they're out there searching. And uh, she told me, and it was a, a Highway 9, which connects Melbourne to Mountain View. It's a really desolate road. And so I get out there, and I was out there maybe five minutes. I ran into a guy I knew, a searcher. And um, he, I, I said, hey, um, I heard you guys are out here looking for Rebecca Gould. And he goes, oh, we found her. She's right there. And I saw her. And um, it was really strange. You know, a lot of times when you, uh, when, when you cover murder cases like I have, and I've covered probably a dozen or more, you don't actually see, you know, the body. But I was there the morning that I saw her. But it actually, as bad as that was, it actually got worse because I went back to the sheriff's department and at the sheriff's department, her dad they, and her sisters had heard a rumor that they'd found a body. And so Larry, it is the uh, doctor I'm talking about, um, he comes up to me and he goes, did they find my daughter? And I looked at him and I said, hey, you, you really need to talk to the sheriff. And Larry, pretty big guy, you know, pretty athletic guy, he grabbed, he grabbed me and pulled me in. And he goes, did they find my daughter? And I said, yeah, they did. I saw her. One side of her face looked like she was asleep. The other side had been skeletalized because she had been uh, bludgeoned in the face. Mm -hmm. So anyway, her murder case has never been solved. I've written about it for you know, 12, 13 years now. And so when I wrote my first book, I wanted to include... My first book is about the West Memphis 3 case. Um, I wrote more stories about that case than any journalist in the world, and that's a verifiable fact. And I only know that because the guys who made both do the uh, Paradise Lost franchise of documentaries about it and the late Amy Burke, who wrote West of Memphis, um, they both told me because they would contact me constantly to get information about the case, and they told me the reason was because I'd written more stories about it than anybody. Um, so, but I wanted to include her case. It didn't really fit into the, what I was trying to do with this book, but I just wanted people to know because I never knew if I'd write another book, and I wanted people to understand that this is a t completely solvable case, and I'm pretty sure I know who killed this girl. And um, so anyway, I always mention it. Well, fast forward, you know, a dozen years or so, I write this book. Well, when you write a book, 
you go on book tour, you know, you go and uh, go to different libraries and bookstores, and I've gone to wineries and done book signings. I mean, it's, and that's a great experience, I'll tell you. <laughs> um, so, yeah, and I, and I remember a little bit of it. So, anyway, well, I'm at a book signing one morning, and this guy walks in, and um, I pull the book out, you know, I pitch it all the way through, and um, I get to the very end, and I always mention her at the very end, because it's the prologue to this book. And um, so I got to the end. There was a photographer there from a magazine taking pictures. And um, I looked at the guy and I said, hey, uh, you want to buy a book? He goes, no. I want to buy 10 of them. And I looked at him. I was like, okay. Well, I looked at the photographer and I said, whatever I just told him, I need to tell everybody. <laughs> and uh, so she's just snapping pictures and... Um, I stack the books up, and I fold the first one over, and I said, do you want me to make this out to anybody or just sign it? And uh, he didn't say a word. He just reached in his pocket, and he pulled out a little ribbon with a picture of a girl on it. And it was her. It was her father. I never told him that I was writing the book. Um, I hadn't seen him in 12, 13 years, something like that. And I didn't recognize him because he was clean-shaven today, and he looked, you know, like he would look... Um, if you were, uh, you know, stout going out on a Saturday night, I mean, it looked when I saw him before, he was scruffy, obviously devastated. Um, and so, um, I tell you, I told you all of that to tell you this. There's an update on that case in my <coughs> new book, um, and I know that probably the vast majority of you are here today because you want to hear about the stories in this book. Um, I will say this about Randolph County, and I say this to people. Um, I work for a company in Little Rock. I tell people all over the state of Arkansas. Randolph County is one of the most fascinating counties in Arkansas. It, there's no doubt about it. Um, I believe it's the only county in the United States that has five navigable rivers. I think it's the only one. Um, you know, the Indian artifacts that they have found here, the Native American Indian artifacts they have here, date back, you know, seven, 8,000 years. And I've talked to archaeologists. They think they may even date further back than that. Um, so this is one of the earliest settled places in the United States of America. Um, and, and, I mean, obviously for, you know, soil, there's all sorts of things. I've written about all this stuff, the Looney Tavern, the Rice Upshaw House. I love all this stuff up here. Wrote about the first, uh, I was talking to some people, wrote about the first uh, school over at Raven and Springs. Um, but there's also another part of Randolph County. You guys have some of the most heinous murders. I mean, there is nothing. I mean, I worked at the Jonesboro Sun for eight years. I didn't cover a murder in Jonesboro. I mean, they try to make the Despain case out to be something similar to this. Um, but there's really no comparison. And so I titled this book The Creekside Bones, and that's, after, that's because of Felicia Elliott, um, because they found her in a creek. Um, and I'll go into that case just a little bit because I know you guys, uh, and I know most of you know the story. Um, and basically the reason I wrote about this case is I covered both capital murder cases, uh, mur murder trials for Chad and Billy Green, and I have a little bit of a different theory as to what happened to the Elliott family than the prosecutors. And um, I've talked to Henry Boyce about it. You know, Henry's a great guy, and um, I actually went and ate lunch with him not too long ago, spoke to his tourism group. And, um, but, uh, you know, <coughs> I remember this night very vividly, the night of the murders, because my son back there, um, by the way, if anybody's on the, on the fence about buying a book from me, my son is going to Hendricks College, the only college in Arkansas he didn't have a full scholarship to. So, um, unless, I mean, unless you guys want him, like, going into public assistance or something, we gotta, we got to get that guy through school. So, uh, anyway, um, he was born... Um, the night before this all happened. And so I was driving through that storm. You know, it was a horrible stormy night when these, when these murders ha happened. And um, I tell people all the time, that story is worse than any horror movie you could watch. And um, so I'm driving through the storm. I'm actually listening to the Cardinals on the radio um, it was the same, you know, it was the same year that Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa were having that epic home run battle. And so I was listening to it. Well, and I remember very vividly that night because around 10 o'clock that night, um, I was driving my wife's car and uh, my father-in-law, who is, uh, you know, he's not with us anymore, but he, uh, he was very mechanically inclined and I am not. And, um, and I, her car, the radiator sprung a leak and I pulled off to the side of the road. Well, literally right at that moment when I was doing that, and I had just passed through Blackrock, 
that's when the Elliots heard a knock at the door. And um, when they heard that knock, um, I believe it was Chad Green who had car trouble down by the river. And I think he legitimately had car trouble. And I think they went down to the river, him and Carl, and um, I think that they got into an argument. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, conjecture that they, that Billy and Chad went there that night to murder Carl. I don't think that was the case. Um, and, I, and the reason is, is because if you look at the evidence in this case, that uh, if you look at the, uh, the autopsy pictures, the um, crime scene photographs, if you heard the stuff that was talked about at trial, it was a clumsy crime. I mean, any, I mean, there should have been, a, I mean, it's, it's a very, they left a lot of evidence, you know, and that's not very typical if it's a sophisticated, well thought out crime. Well, this one wasn't. Um, I think that they went down to the river. I think that him and Carl got into an argument for whatever reason. They got high on meth or whatever they got high on. And Chad, a lot of people don't know this, he had a really bad habit of taking a gun out and just shooting it at people just to scare them. And I think what probably happened was is he got that gun out and he shot Carl by accident. And then he didn't know what to do. So then he shoots him again. Well, at that point, you know, Lisa saw him leave. She had just made him a glass of tea in their house while Carl was getting his boots on. And so they knew he was there. Well, when, and, and uh, Chad actually admitted this to a private investigator in 2004 before the original, um, original trial for Billy Green. He admitted this. He said, I was the one who killed the entire family. And he said what happened was he accidentally shot Carl, and then he went to the house in Carl's Thunderbird, and everybody thought, and he said, hey, I hit, the devil was in me, I hit the door running. Well, and this is going to, I mean, this is graphic, but I know you guys know it. The little boy came running up to his left, thought it was his dad coming in the door is what I think. He had a tire tool in his hand. <coughs> he crushed that kid's head like an eggshell. Um, the forensic pathologist who examined Gregory's body said that he would have died within minutes without, if they had a surgical team there, he probably still would have died just from the blow. But the killer didn't stop there. He took the other end of the tire tool, the, the sharp, dull end, he jammed it through his throat. And the boy bled out on the floor. Then he beat Lisa like a rag doll. Hit her 27 times in the head. Blood everywhere. Uh, one of the crime scene investigators, a guy that has worked many, 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 many murder cases, said it was the worst thing he's ever seen in his life, and it was like a bloodbath in there. Walls were covered in blood, and they were. I'm telling you, the pictures were just unbelievable. So after he gets done beating this woman to death, he goes into the little girl's room. She's <coughs> hiding under her bed or somewhere. Tire tool in his hand. Drops tire tool among her stuffed animals. And you can see it in a picture. It's just laying there covered in blood. Well, then she is taken out, wrapped up in a blanket, taken out to the car. Well, at the, this whole time it's raining, the, it's thunderstorming, it's really bad. Well, as the killer is about to drive away, or killers, one thing about being a journalist, I always say this, I don't know for sure whenever I give a theory about a case. Um, there's no definitively way to know without being there. Um, but this is the theory based on the facts I've seen. So... As the killer's getting, away, getting ready to drive away, he sees something in the yard, and it's Lisa. She woke up, crawled out the window in the kitchen, and she was crawling to her parents' house that they lived next door. She got to the porch when the killer came up behind her and slashed her throat oh. from one end to the other. There's a bloody imprint on the door the next morning, and she bled out right there on the porch. On her parents' door? Parents' door, yes. I mean, there's a hand, it's a complete hand. Were they in the house? They were in the house. And she's in the trailer. Yes. I mean, they didn't. Yeah, and I, and I was, you know, I've been, been told conflicting stories about this, like um, that the, one of the parents or both of them had some type of issue. Um, but it was also a really stormy night, and I think it was commonplace maybe for Lisa and Carl to get into pretty loud arguments, that type of thing. So it wouldn't have been anything, you know, that might have just raised an immediate alarm with them. They called the police the next morning when they couldn't open the door because her body was obstructing the door. Um, her autopsy photo, I can tell you right now, is probably the most horrifying thing I've ever seen. I've seen a bunch of them. And um, it, 
it, it was a brutal, brutal crime, but it was very, very clumsy. Like I said, they left the murder weapon at the crime scene. So my contention has been Chad was a pedophile. Okay, He was convicted of raping a, a, a girl um, the same age as Felicia before. Um, so Billy... For all, I mean, and Billy was a bad guy. I mean, every, anybody who knows anything about him knows he was a bad guy. But I think um, that at least the first three, I think it was all chat. I think it was just a clumsy, they got high, and it just went, went bad, went south quick. Now, the little girl, that could be a different thing. Um, and I would like to tell you that she wasn't kept in a barrel in a garage. She probably was. And she was brought out whenever that monster wanted to do something to her. And then she was put back in the barrel. And then eventually Billy, Billy may have killed her um, because he, he might not have known for a day or two that Chad kept her. Um, and then when he found out that Chad kept her, um, he said, we got to get rid of her. And so he took her out to the creek and he slit her throat in the creek and she died there. Um, so anyway... That's the first chapter in this book. Um, I lay it out. I covered both murder, uh, capital murder cases. Um, I write pretty, I'll use the term clean. I get to the point quick. I don't mess around. Um, and so that's the first chapter. Um, and then the second chapter, this is Sydney Randall. She was a little girl who lived over in Walnut Ridge. She was 15, or yeah, I think she, no, she was 14. She was about to turn 15. Um, and again, this is kind of an irony for me. My wife was her teacher. I knew her. And um, I remember her. Uh, I remember her, she used to hang out in my wife's classroom um, a lot. And um, I also remember her stepfather, John Cornell. And... Um, I'll never forget it. Uh, my wife, on Sundays, a lot of times, she'd go up to her classroom to, to get stuff ready for, you know, the upcoming school week. And one day I was watching TV. I just caught the end of the news, and somebody said that there was somebody missing in Walnut Ridge, that there were two people missing. And I was like, I didn't catch it. Well, my wife calls me, and she goes, Sydney's, Sydney's gone. And I was like, and Sydney was, one of, was a student in her very first class that she ever taught. And so, uh, and the thing she remembered about her, she was real, like, athletic. She was, like, could do, like, tumbles and gymnastics type stuff. She was real good at that stuff. So um, I told my wife, I said, don't worry. I mean, unfortunately, you know, a, a kid running off with their stepdad is not a big deal. You know, or not, it is a big deal, but it's not a deal that's even really super newsworthy because it happens all the time, you know. And um, so I, I didn't think she was in any, any danger. Um, but then um, the next day, you know, this was on a Sunday that they disappeared. And what happened was, is Sydney, it was 10 o'clock on a Saturday night. Her mom was about to go to bed. Um, Sydney was in the kitchen getting a drink of water. Mom goes to bed. She wakes up at 3 o'clock in the morning, and she, um, she notices the lights on in her, in her room. And she's like, this is really strange. So she gets up, she goes and checks on her other two, her, she had an older son and a, and a younger one. She goes and checks on them, well then she goes in Sydney's room, and it, uh, by the way, at this point she's noticed her, her husband's not in bed. She goes in Sydney's room, she flips on a light, but she's not there. So she starts calling, frantically calling, friends, family members, um, calls the hospital to see if maybe they went to the emergency room. Well then... Um, she gets to a point where she's like really panicked, so she calls the police. Well, right at that moment, her husband's truck pulls into the driveway. She goes outside and says, hey, where's Sydney? And he goes, I don't know. And she goes, well, she's not here. And he goes, well, I'm going to go call the police. And she goes, well, don't worry, I already did that. We'll just wait for him. And then he immediately gets in his truck and he leaves. He's gone. So um, fast forward now back to Monday. That was Saturday night. Well, they're both gone. Well, they find his body outside of Walnut Ridge um, in a field. Um, he was shot in the head. And um, so for the next two to three months, they looked for her body everywhere. And, I mean, there were so many rumors flying around that she had met some guy on the Internet and that he had killed John. And there was just all these rumors going on. Well, then finally um, they found Sydney um, floating in the Black River on May 18th, 2013. Um, and the, I mean, um, I, it, I'll say this. One thing that's really hard to deal with 
it's I've literally had to ask somebody right after their son, fourteen year old son, got murdered. Within an hour, I've had to ask them for a comment about it, and it's tough. I mean, and people go, "Oh man, how can you, you're so terrible?" You know, go ask them for a comment like that. I have found this sometimes it's therapeutic for them. I mean, they they want to talk about their their loved one, um, but it's it's tough. I mean, I've been a, gosh, I've had I had to talk to a grandpa one time who was grandson was accused of molesting a bunch of kids and he was a teacher and um, so anyway um, so part of one thing that's really tough is dealing with the family of like someone who has committed a heinous thing because they become a victim too they had nothing to do with it but it's their brother or their sister whoever their grandpa they've done this terrible thing so and they'll they'll always call and argue like I can't believe you're writing about this you know what about this? What about that? And I'm like, and I always try to be very nice to him, but I'm also very stern about it. That look, I would never write about this or this or any of this if it didn't happen. And that's the fact. I wouldn't do it. I, I told a lady one time, I said, if we don't ever have another murder in this world, I'll be the happiest person for it. I have seen it. I've sat, I've been on death row. I was down there for the, uh, I covered three of the four executions that we had back in April. And, um, so, but dealing with those family members is tough, and in this particular case, and I write about it in the book, there was one family member who really was really upset, and I had to tell her the truth. I had to report. I didn't put everything in there. Now, it's in the book. I, I've put everything in there. I mean, and it's graphic. I, I'll tell you guys this right now. This book is not, I mean, it's graphic. I don't uh, pull any punches. And um, so anyway, that's, um, that case always stuck in my crawl a little bit, um, just because I knew her, and she had a connection to my wife. Now, there's another chapter in this book about, and it's a very short chapter, but it's it's just an insane case over in Sharp County. Um, this woman disappeared. She went for a walk one day and she vanished. And um, I saw her missing poster at Walmart long before I was even a journalist. And uh, no one was looking for this woman. She was 21 years old. She had a couple kids. And... Um, so I started writing um, stories about her once I started working for the newspaper because the police weren't doing anything. They were not looking for this woman. And so um, after about a year of writing stories, um, I was trying to find this aunt. And uh, because this aunt was the one who put the poster out, but her cell phone number had changed, her address had changed, everything had changed. Could never get a hold of her. Well, my sister um, went to uh, Walmart one day to buy my kids a sprinkler. Because she'd come into town and wanted to play with them or whatever. So um, while she's in line, a lady's talking about St. Bernard puppies. My sister had a friend who was looking for a St. Bernard puppy. My sister, she kind of knows me. She talks to people a lot. <laughs> so uh, anyway, man, my son will vouch for that. He just got back from her house. He'd been down there for a couple months in Dallas. So uh, she gets a card. And so the sprinkler sucked, so we were like, ugh. Let's go. There's a lake called, uh, 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 there's a lake in Horseshoe Bend, nice little lake. You can take your kids out there. So her and I decided we'll take my kids up there to the lake. We're on a road called Peace Valley Road. And um, she starts talking. And I just want her to shut up. I'm like, come on, I don't care about these stupid dogs and all this stuff and blah, blah, blah. She has this card in her hand. And I look down, and it was the lady's name. It was the aunt. I go, are you kidding me right now? Stopped the car in the road, got her cell phone, called the aunt, and it was her. And here's the ironic part about Peace Valley Road. The last place that Bridget was seen, her name is Bridget Sellers, by the way, was on Peace Valley Road. And that's exactly where I saw the card. The aunt lived on Peace Valley Road. I had no idea where she lived at this point. So anyway, to make a long story really short, um, the circumstances that they found, they found this girl. And I'm telling you, it is one of the most diabolical things you've ever heard of in your life. And see, I won't tell you what happened. You have to read the <laughs> so, anyway, and then there's another chapter in here um, about, and of course, I know everybody in here knows Bob Castleman. Um, I'll say this uh, the only person in here who doesn't know Bob Castleman is me. Um, I actually was uh, kind of a. A weird thing, I was working at the Jonesboro Sun when a lot of this stuff went down with Bob, and so I would have to cover it um, a lot through, we had a, um, like a, this is just a wonky 
journalism. We had like a content partnership with a media organization down Little Rock, so they would call us and tell us like what was happening in court, and then I'd write it up. And um, when I decided to write this book, um, I needed one more case to kind of fill it out. And literally his, I mean, everybody knows. <laughs> I mean, it is literally one of the most interesting cases you could pop. I mean, if you go from start to finish from where, you know, he went from being, you know, this really lauded um, attorney um, to just, I mean, like that series Breaking Bad, that's Bob Castleman. I mean, everything from the stolen Indian artifacts that he was, you know, selling, or not selling, but trying to get claim insurance on, and the FBI goes up to his best friend's house in Corning, and there they are sitting in the living room. I mean, they didn't even bother to hide them. And, um, you know, to the, you know, the murder here in town, to the how that whole thing went down. And um, I write all about that. I mean, uh, from start to finish, you know, the snakes. I mean, um, the snake that got mailed to the neighbor. I mean, my gosh. I mean, that was an international story. I mean, if you can type up Pocahontas, it's one of the first things that will pop up. In Sweden, they called it a king cobra. Yeah, they did. That's exactly right. And, yeah, so... And um, so anyway, I included that chapter in there, um, and um, I literally I went through uh, pretty much all the court documents, all that other stuff. Um, I saw where Jared Kaufman wasn't very happy about uh, the, you know, the book I wrote, but you know I, I can't. This is what I tell people: I can't help what other people do. It has nothing to do with me. Um, so anyway, that is this book in a nutshell. Um, I uh, you know I. And I ask anybody who buys it to maybe write me a review on Amazon if you liked it. Now, if you didn't, just forget I said that. Okay? Um, but I do want to get into this book just a little bit. Are you guys all familiar with the West Memphis 3 case? Okay. Well, um, basically what happened in this book, and oh, and by the way, if you're not interested in the West Memphis 3 case, I always try to sell this book by these neat pictures of Johnny Depp that I've got, <laughs> and Eddie Vedder, so we got any Pearl Jam fans out there? Which my son was trying to torture me with all the way up here. Um, so this case, um, I was the fourth guy in line to cover one hearing on this case back in 2008. Um, we had, you guys remember the huge tornado that ripped through Highland? Okay, well, um, there was a rumor going around that Oprah was going to show up and do one of her deals that she used to do, like community things. And it just was coincidentally the same day that my daughter had a softball game in Highland. So I told my boss, I was like, well, if Oprah shows up and I'm not there, it would look really bad. So I, Oprah didn't show up. I go... Um, to the, I go to the game. Well, while I'm at the game, I get a phone call. And it's from my managing editor. And she's like, hey, um, do you think you could cover West Memphis 3 hearing tomorrow in Jonesboro? I was like, yeah, I cover anything. So click. And I was like, I looked at my wife. I'm like, what's West Memphis 3? And uh, so that night we go home. I do an internet search. And I'm like, oh, okay, it's that documentary that we saw. You know, we saw the documentary back in the day. We thought, hey, you know, it looked kind of suspicious. Well, I go to the hearing. Um, any baseball fans in here? Okay. Barry, you guys know who Barry Bonds is. Okay. His attorney was a guy named Dennis Reardon. This guy is one of the finest attorneys. I mean, he is literally, like, if you're in trouble and you got lots and lots of money, you call Dennis Reardon because he'll get you out of it. Well, and Barry Bonds, that was his attorney in the Valco Steroids case. Dennis Reardon took on this case pro bono. He would fly from San Francisco to Jonesboro on his own dime, to represent Damien Eccles. And um, so he was in the courtroom. We were in there maybe 10 minutes. I saw Jason Baldwin, and I looked over, and I thought to myself, wow, there's a child killer right there. He didn't look like a child killer, but he was one. I mean, that's what we were told. So um, I covered that one hearing, and the reason I did is because the reporter of the Jones World Sun, who covered this, Stan Mitchell, some of you might know Stan. Okay, well, Stan got... He got subpoenaed, I guess he had, there was some people in his family got into like this horrible divorce, and for some reason he got subpoenaed in to like go and, and, and um, testify in their civil proceeding. I mean, he literally got served at his desk. I thought it was pretty funny. I laughed at him for a while over that because we sat by each other. But uh, So he was gone, and then we had two other capital murder cases going on in Jonesboro, so the other, his two backups were gone. And I was just the fourth one on. I mean, I was just the fourth. I covered Randolph and Lawrence County at that time. I was up here doing stories about the museum. 
literally. And so, um, well, after doing it one whole time, I became an expert on it, obviously. I mean, who wouldn't, right? So um, Stan left the Jonesboro Sun, and then um, since I'd covered one hearing, and they just kept dumping it on me, there were literally uh, whole weeks of testimony after, it's called a Rule 37. It's where you come in at your last gasp to try to get a new trial. And basically what you do is you go in there and you throw everything against the wall. My attorney sucked, you know, the weather was bad. These are all the reasons why I didn't, yeah, I got convicted. So there, and, and Judge Burnett um, decided, hey, we're going to let every, we're going to let you got, whatever argument you think you can make, make it. So they started bringing in world-renowned experts. And I'm talking like Dr. Warner Spitz, who sat on the Congressional Assassinations Committee for JFK and Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., um, they brought him in. He writes the forensic pathology books that forensic pathologists study to get their doctorates. Okay, he's the guy. Dr. Michael Bodden. I'm sure you guys. I'm sure several of you have seen him on TV. He's been on Fox News, CNN. Um, he was the city medical examiner for the city of New York for ten years. Um, he he writes episodes of CSI, like twenty of them, as a hobby. Um, and then they brought in a guy named Dr. Richard Suvern. And Dr. Richard Suvern was very interesting to me because. He is the guy who helped ID Ted Bundy, the serial killer. Um, and for those of you who don't know, Ted Bundy was a very meticulous with his victims. He was very meticulous about getting rid of evidence. But he had one fetish that he could not control. He loved to bite his victims. Dr. Richard Suverin was the forensic odontologist in Miami-Dade. He called, okay, when Bundy got caught the last time, it was in Pensacola, Florida. He had just killed um, uh, several girls in, the, um, in a sorority house. In, at Florida State University. And um, so they caught him um, in Pensacola, but again, they had a really hard time because there was no evidence tying him to the crime. And here's the thing. He was a magician in a courtroom. He was a law student, and he, several judges that he went before said, hey, this guy really, he had been a great lawyer. And so, but he had the one fetish where he liked to bite his victims. Well, Dr. Richard Suverin came in, um, and he was able to prove that that Bundy, that his bite impressions were on those bodies. So he came and testified at this case, and he sat down, and basically he looked at the judge, and he said, this is the stupidest thing I've ever seen. He put it, and when I was, out, I was outside talking to him afterwards, he put his arm around me and he said, this is the worst case of injustice I've seen in 40 years of working criminal cases. And so at this point, I really started having some doubts, um, because, you know, the, a lot of these are opinions, you know, as far as forensic pathology, it's actually, some of it's more of an art than a science, literally, even though it doesn't seem like it should be. Um, but then the DNA evidence started coming in, you know. And uh, the three guys who were in prison for this case, um, none of their DNA was found at the crime scene, but one of the stepfather's DNA was. And his DNA was found on one of the victims and one of the ligatures that bound the three boys. And it wasn't found on his stepson, it was found on another son. Well then... They find another hair at the crime scene that's tested, and it matches his alibi witness. So then you've got, and Linda, you, I mean, you put these do, you just put these dominoes together. You have his DNA there, his alibi witness's DNA there, and then you get the third element. He, um, uh, the night that the boys disappeared, two of the boys, um, Christopher um, Byers and uh, Michael Moore's parents called the police within an hour of them disappearing. The police were out looking for two boys. The third boy, Stevie Branch, wasn't reported missing. At 9.30 that night, his, his mom was at work. At 9.30 that night, the stepdad goes to pick her up. He um, doesn't, he walks right past her. Doesn't say, hey, your son's missing, your, our son or your son is missing. He goes to a payphone and calls the police and says, hey, my stepson's missing. She goes to the car. There's a four-year-old girl in the car. And she, uh, the four-year-old girl tells her mother, she goes, where's Stevie at? And she goes, uh, well, Mama, he's missing. We don't know where he's or not missing. Mama, he's gone. We don't know where he's at. And I know this story because Pam Hobbs, the mom, told me to my face. And so you start to put that together. Then um, um, Terry Hobbs decided, and that's the stepdad, he decided, okay, in 2007, after the DNA came out, Natalie Maines from the Dixie Chicks, very nice lady. We were born in the same town in Texas. Um, uh, 
she comes out and says, hey, Terry Hobbs is a real killer in this case. Well, he decides to sue her. And this is the funny thing about suing someone is you better be very careful. Because here's the thing. You think you can sue somebody for saying something about you, but they can turn around and sue you for trying to take away their right to say it. <laughs> so, because you have a constitutional, um, it's constitutionally protected speech. So he sued Natalie Maines of the Dixie Chicks, and he lost and had to pay her $20,000. So anyway, um, but what happened is he had never been interviewed by police, ever. Which is really strange, because every other parent in the case was. Todd Moore, who wasn't even in the state of Arkansas when this whole thing happened, he was a truck driver, he was out of state, verifiably, he was interviewed. But Terry Hobbs was not. But now they interviewed him, and you can look this up on YouTube. You can take the two interviews side by side. He's interviewed twice, and they're incoherent. You know, they're, the story changes. His, his two stories change. And also during this time, there were three women who were on their way to church that afternoon when the boys disappeared who um, they didn't realize that he, he claimed that he never saw the boys that day, that he came home from work, they were out playing on their bikes, he never saw them. Um, so anyway, he claimed that, well, there was three women on their way to church, and they're like, that's not true. We were on our way to church at 6.30 that night. The three boys came through this woman's yard. One of her daughters, who was friends with Christopher Byers' older brother, Ryan, said, hey, I think your brother's looking for you right now. You need to... Uh, go home. Christopher Byers tells her, he goes, you don't tell me what to do. You're not my boss. So then at that moment, a man up a, a, on, on the street in front of the Hobbs house, a guy who looks exactly like Terry Hobbs from these three witnesses' descriptions, motions the boys, or at least his boy and the other two boys follow, to the house. And so um, anyway, to make a long story short, their testimony was never heard in uh, court, obviously, because they didn't know. And secondly, the judge in the case would never allow them to, like, they, they swore, they, they gave a deposition and a sworn affidavit, and, um, but they were never, it was, it was never allowed to be part of the um, official record of the case. Now, when they let these guys out in 2011, I'll say this, um, I was there, um, actually, I broke the story two hours before the New York Times did. Um, so I'm always, I'm always proud of that. Um, and how I found out it was the stupid, I mean, literally it was the dumbest thing ever. I was sitting at my desk, and I had nothing to do. I mean, I had to write a story, and I was like, oh, gosh, what am I going to do today? I was like, oh, I'll write a story, because they were going to have a hearing in December of that year. And um, I was like, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call Judge Burnett and see if, or not Judge Burnett, I'm going to call the new judge, Judge David Laser, and say, hey, Judge, are you going to let recording devices in the courtroom? Because David Burnett, after the HBO documentary fiasco made him look so bad, he didn't even let photographers, like, bring cameras in there. So... Um, <laughs> I started calling around, and I called the lady that I knew at the Arkansas Department of Correction, and she got real quiet. Like, I was just talking to her. I was like, hey, are they going to have a hearing? You know, I was asking her some questions about when the hearings are going to be, and she goes, uh, well, they're going to have a hearing tomorrow. I was like, tomorrow? Uh, which is not that uh, aston astonishing. I mean, it happened a lot where they would just pop up and have one. And then she got really quiet, and she's like, I shouldn't tell you this, but I'm going to. She goes, they're taking all their stuff with them. And I was like, there's only one reason why you take all your stuff with you is because you're not coming back. So I called Dennis Rudin, Barry Bonds' attorney. He gave me his <laughs> private cell phone number. Right. I call him up. I'm like, Dennis. And immediately when I hear his voice, I can hear he's in an airport. I said, you're in an airport right now, Dennis. I said, are you flying back to Arkansas? And he goes, wow. He goes, word sure does get around fast. And I said, yeah. <laughs> so they let him out. And... This happens to me a lot. You know, I go and give talks about this case a lot. And there's inevitably one or two people in the crowd who go, oh, but why would anybody falsely confess to a murder they didn't commit? It just doesn't happen, right? Well, see this little girl right here? Her name is Jessica Williams. Okay? Two years to the day, almost, within a day or two, of those three guys getting out of prison, that girl was playing in her yard in Gosnell, Arkansas. Her dad looks out. She's on her bike. That puppy, Rybach, is in the basket. He goes back to doing whatever he's doing. Well, he looks out the window a second time, and she's gone. He's like, hmm. So he goes outside and says, hey, you know, he's looking for her. He's like, it's time to come home. Well, a neighbor comes up and says, hey, I think you need to see something. 
her bike was on the side of a gravel road, and the puppy and her were gone. Well, they spend all night looking for this girl, and uh, the next morning, a couple of girls on ATVs find the dog walking about 11 miles away from where she was last seen out in a place called Half Moon, which is out in the middle of nowhere, Mississippi County. Well, the, the searchers take the dog back to the spot where the dog was found, and the dog leads them right to her body. It's in a watery kind of ditch over like a little bridge area. Within 24 hours, her 17-year-old, mentally impaired neighbor who rode the school bus with her, Christopher South, confesses to her murder. And here's the thing. He got some of the details right. I read his confession. It seemed legit. But there was only one problem with it. Um, at the time, and I, they put a gag order on the case, so it was hard to get information. But Christopher Sal was out looking for her within a half an hour of her disappearing and with her dad. The problem is he didn't have a car. So how did he go 11 miles, dump her body, and get back? Well, there's ways. You know, maybe he stashed her body and did it later when nobody was paying attention, you know. Um, so there's all sorts of theories, but it's still it just kind of bothered me. So I would call Scott Ellington, the prosecutor, again, a guy I really like, um, even though I disagree with him on the West Memphis 3 case. Um, and so I call him, I'm like, hey, you know, can you kind of explain this? It's just kind of weird, you know, that he's out looking for her half an hour, within a half hour of disappearing. He's like, oh, no, we'll explain that at trial. And I'm like, okay. Well, when they did the autopsy of that little girl, they found one sperm cell. One. And they DNA tested that sperm cell. And it didn't belong to the guy who confessed to her murder. It belonged to another neighbor, Freddie Sharp III, who had come home early from work, had two kids that played with her there around the same time. So he lured her into his Jeep, and he raped and he killed her. His explanation at trial as to how his sperm cell got into her body was that he was peeing off that bridge that night while he was looking for her with his, yeah, it's just crazy. Um, yeah, and that's how it got in there. Now, to this day, he has not been charged with her murder, as far as I'm aware of. Now, he has been convicted of a rape, and he's in jail for 25 years for that. But I assume that at some point, prosecutors will eventually charge him with the murder. Um, but Scott told me he's in jail for now, and um, they have to build the case. You know, and it, things are not as cut and dry. Like, I talked about Terry Hodges in the West Memphis 3 case. Yeah, his DNA is there, yes. His alibi witness DNA is there, yes. He has a very he has con conflicting stories about where he was when this whole thing happened. But sitting on a jury, it'd still be hard to convict him. I mean, there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of different ways you can look at all that evidence. So um, anyway, that's my that's my first book, um, and I uh, I kind of. And I'm not going to lie to you. I won't lie to you guys. I actually had to write this book first in order to write this one. And the reason is is because it's a lot harder to get people to, interested in a story about just some murders in nowhere, Arkansas, when they are at, I hate to use this term, they're fascinating. I mean, they're really, they're, they're deep. They're, I mean, there's a lot of psychology in there. And they are fascinating stories. But I knew if I wrote this one first, it would open the door for the second one. Um, so, uh, I guess at this point, does anybody have any questions? Um, when is Chad Green getting out of prison? Oh, uh, gosh, he's in uh, life, he's life without parole. Oh, is he? Okay. Yeah. Good. And, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and be, people ask me all the time. I mean, I've interviewed some really heinous bad dudes, and he's probably the worst. I mean, Billy got convicted for the murders, didn't he, or did Chad also? No, they both got, they both got, they both got life, okay, without, with life without parole. Is Byers still in Shark County? No, um, John Mark Byers. Last time I last time I checked on him, he was living, I think, somewhere like Blyville, somewhere around Blyville. That's kind of where his family's from. Um, the directors of the Paradise Lost franchise actually became real good friends with those guys through the years, and they told me that he was one of the most fascinating characters in film history. I mean, they really believe that. Terry Byers? Or, or, no. John Mark Byers. John Mark Byers. And a lot of people... His wife died, too, yeah. not too long ago. Do what now? He's the one whose wife died. She died, like, three years after the murders. Yeah. yeah. And here's the thing. A lot of people, when I, hear, when I hear the word stepdad, they always think of him. That's not the stepdad we're talking about. We're talking about another stepdad. Yeah, because... Do you not think that there's a link between those two? 
No. no. And this is the reason why. Terry Hobbs and John Mark Byers didn't even know each other until the murders. They didn't know who the other one was. Um, and here's the thing about John Mark Byers. For as crazy as he acted and for all of what people thought, he has an ironclad alibi for where he was when, he, when, when the boys disappeared. They, he was in a court room where he had to sign in. His, son had to take a def his older son had to take a defensive driving course. He had to sign in, and part of the punishment is you got to bring your, one of your parents up there to take it with you. So that was kind of a way to stop you from driving bad, I guess. So, um, so he always had a verifiable alibi, and that's what I always told those West Memphis Three Sports when they thought it was him. I'm like, he's got an alibi. I mean, and he was the first one to call the police. You know, if I commit a murder, I'm the last one to call the police. <laughs> because the further time you get from murder to when they find out about it, the better chance you have of getting away with it. And that's just a fact. Yes, ma'am? On the dream case, um, there was evidence there in the room what took him so long to, be, to come to um, the arresting body. I think it was about five years. It took five, and ironically, five years to the day. It was it was July 29th, 2003, that they were arrested. Um, I, I'll tell you guys this right now. I'm going to be, I'll be brutally honest. If I was sitting on one of those jurors, juries, I wouldn't have voted to convict either one of them. Contaminated. A there is no physical evidence, no DNA, no forensic evidence that ties Billy or Chad Green to those murders, period. The only thing that ties them to those murders is the testimony of family members and Chad's own admissions after he was given a plea deal, which he was given a plea deal. So guess what? If you go back to retrial, I mean, there, Linda, you know what I'm talking about. There's a lot of issues there. Yeah, there's a lot of issues there um, based on the, there's just, there's no physical evidence. I mean, there are people, when I, I make this statement all the time, there are, there are people sitting in prison that there's less evidence against than Terry Hobbs, and what I'm talking about is the Greens, because there's no evidence. I have no doubt that they did it, um, but there's a threshold there that's, it's hard to meet. Um, they, I mean, they, they tried to, you know, they found some bloody shorts, and they found, um, you know, there was blood on the weapon. But back in 1998, they, really, they didn't have the technology to, they couldn't do the fine mitochondrial DNA testing. They could tell what blood type it was, but, you know, heck, I mean, there's, what, five, six blood types? I mean, that just puts you in the ballpark of probability, but it doesn't give you beyond a reasonable doubt. Bob Kesselman hasn't been charged with murder, that murder yet either, has No, he? Bob has not been charged with Travis uh, Perkins' murder. Um, it's, it's a really weird quirk in the law. Um, okay, so, like, he was, he was, basically what happened with Travis was, you know, they had the eight people that they had arrested in this drug ring, um, and slowly but surely they were picking people off. You know, like saying, hey, turn on him, turn on him, turn on him. We'll give you a deal, we'll give you a deal. And that's how it works. You know, you get eight people in. You're only going to get two or three really hard time. So you pick off as many as you can. Well, they were about to pick Travis off three days before he was murdered. He was going to go testify at a, at a federal courthouse in Little Rock. Um, about the, and he knew the ins and outs of the whole operation. And so what happens is, so it's a drug case. Well, they don't have to, it's really weird. If you can prove that a homicide is attached or a part of a drug conspiracy in federal law, there's, um, they can basically give you an additional sentence of like 20 to 30 years. So they didn't have to prove that he murdered him. All they had to prove was that the death was associated with the um, drug trafficking. With the drug, yeah, right, with the drug trafficking. That if, for some reason, he was murdered because of this drug stuff. And so that's all they had to prove. And so he got like an, I don't know what it was, an additional 25 years just because of that, which it would, I mean, again, it would be really hard to convict him of Travis's murder. Um, but, of course, I mean, you know, his son testified to it at the drug trial that that's what happened. So, yes, ma'am. This is about the West Memphis Three. I heard a couple of times about a guy that came in Bojangles' restaurant with yes. blood on him. What yes. do you think about that? Is there anything to that? Yeah, there is. I mean, um, curious. if you look at the proximity between the Bojangles restaurant where the bodies were dumped, it's less than half a mile. Um, it happened at dusk. Uh, a, a black man wandered into the restroom, the women's restroom. He was covered in blood. 
Um, he defecated on the floor. He was trying to jam things down in the toilet and flush it. Um, that night, from a, a nearby apartment complex, they heard a couple of gunshots. And, um, and then he, of course, vanishes out of, out of the bathroom. Um, they, never collect the, they didn't collect the evidence that night. The same officer who responded to three boys being missing is the same officer who went to the Bojangles restaurant. This is the part that's, that's bad, but it gets worse because they actually sent a detective in there the next day because after these three boys have been missing all night, they thought, oh, you know, maybe that blood-covered guy who was, like, right over there where these bodies were dumped, maybe he had something to do with it. So, um, so they go in there, they collect blood off a wall, and then they lose the evidence. And here's the thing. They found a hair at the crime scene that belonged to a black male. It's a one in one trillion chance that they couldn't um, identify, like, it, there's the hair, and then here's the person who donated it. It's almost a perfect DNA match. So if you had a sample from the person who um, donated the hair, you could match them up. It's the best piece of uh, forensic evidence that they found at the crime scene. So, and here, and, and people have asked me, okay, well, how does that tie into all this other stuff? Well, here's the thing. People got to realize something about West Memphis, Arkansas. It has one intrinsic value. It is the pinch point for all goods trafficked from north to south and east to west in the United States of America. It is the pinch point from Chicago to New Orleans, from L.A. all the way to the east coast. Think about it. All the 40 runs through there, 55 runs through there. So all your stuff, all your groceries, all the furniture you buy, every, all your cars, they all go through West Memphis at some point. But guess what else goes through there? Drugs. So if you're a drug kingpin in South America and, you, and you're, you're worth billions of dollars, there's pinch points on the map that you want to control. West Memphis is one of those pinch points. And so there was a lot of nefarious stuff going on with law enforcement there at the time. Um, they were, there was a, 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 an, a, the state police were investigating for missing guns and weapons and drugs. There's probably all sorts of things like when you open that can up, there's gonna, you're going to find things that are you know, probably really sinister. So um, that, first of all, that's why they didn't want those people being involved. And another thing is... <laughs> whoever killed these kids might have needed help moving them. And I think that whoever did it needed help, and this person helped them. Well, guess what? If you're a notorious, if, if you're involved in the drug trade, you've been, probably been arrested a few times, you've probably been convicted of some felonies, and then you help move three dead kids, or almost dead <laughs> kids, well, what's the first rule of assassination? Get rid of the assassin. You just help me do this, I'll get rid of you. Where can you go? Can't go to police. You know, who, 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 what's he going to do? Go in there and say, hey, I helped kill these three kids. So, but yeah, I think, there's def I think that is definitely, there's no doubt in my mind that's connected in some way. Yes, sir. Do you know anything about the Martin Casey in Memphis Springs? <coughs> in Memphis? I was trying to think, when was that? I couldn't tell you, it's been a while, it's been a long time. Okay, yeah, I would have to think about it. And I, this sounds really crazy. I've covered so many murders that they'll literally, I'll just forget, the, I mean, like, uh, it, it, because there's just so many of them, it's hard to keep track of all of them. In the Green case, how do you, if he didn't have any intention of doing that, how do you kill people with a tire iron and not leave a no. fingerprint, a thumbprint, anywhere? It, it, it literally seems impossible, and it should be. I just say dumb luck. I mean, or maybe he did wipe that one tool down. I don't know. Um, the thing about it is, I just, if, if Billy did it and it, he was orchestrating it, they could have gotten, if they, want, if they want to kill Carl, let's say. Let's say Carl had stolen drugs or money from him, whatever the case was. I think that they could have got Carl when he was away from his family. Because you don't, I mean, you don't want to kill, listen, and I'll say this. You kill a guy who's involved in the drug trade, yeah, it's bad. It is not going to get a bunch of attention. You know, that happens. It happens. People, I hate to use the term, they get whacked, you know. Um, you go and kill a family of four, that story goes all over the country. I mean, that's, and, and criminals know that. Billy would know that. Billy would know, hey, we don't, we don't want to kill the whole family. We, we might need to deal with Carl, but we'll, we don't want to kill the whole family. And here's the thing. If you were going to get him, you could, you could get Carl away from everybody. And um, so that's why I think and the, the crime scene was just really clumsy. I mean, number one rule, if you kill someone, you don't leave the murder weapon there. 
I mean, that's just common sense. I mean, anybody who's never murdered anybody would know that. Um, and then to take the girl, because that girl's going to leave those. Look, the, that, and you guys, I'm sure some of y'all lived out there or know, that place was covered with people for days and days and days. Everybody was looking for them. Everybody was talking about it. I mean, it was, it was, a, it was a sensation at the time. But there's nothing DNA now could no. prove. No, the evidence is just, it's just not there. Um, they've, it, a lot of times the testing had come back inconclusive on a lot of the blood, on the, all the blood evidence that was tested. Chad's girlfriend talked about him coming over to Cherokee Village or wherever where she lived. It was, covered in blood. Yeah, he had some bloody shorts on, and they took those shorts. She gave them to him. And I hate to say this because I don't ever want to make fun of nobody, but man, when she came into the courtroom, that, that was the second trial. Yeah, she she no this was yeah this during the second set of trials, mm -hmm. she looked really really rough, and even Chad when he saw her, yes. he like nearly jumped out of his seat. He was like, everybody gasped and, when he saw her the second time. Oh my gosh! The first and, time she was you know yeah. Texas hair and all that stuff. Yeah, for him yeah. to be shocked like that. I mean, even the Democrat Gazette reporter, who's a friend of mine, was sitting with him. He started laughing. He's like, man, he goes, that's pretty rough. <clears throat> the, the, the little girl in your wife's class. Yes. So they can conclusively prove that her stepdad killed her? Yeah, um, her, her, here's the thing. And he killed himself? He killed himself. He would have got away with that crime had it not been for one thing. He got, if he had gotten back in that house before the mom had woken up, yeah. there's one thing that tied him to her murder. Her DNA was found on his penis in two places. Mm. And her DNA was found on his fingernails. So by the time they ever found her in the river months later, that, obviously that evidence would be long gone. Yeah. And then we would be sitting here speculating, thinking that the mom did it, or maybe the older brother did it, or maybe some other person came into the picture and did it. But because he wasn't able to get back in the house before this all went down, we know that he did it. And I put that in the newspaper, and people were very horrified by it, but I was like, sorry. So he killed himself because he didn't get, he didn't get home and had to take a bath. Basically, yeah. Wow. Yeah. I don't just cover murderers, I cover other stuff, too. <laughs> There's a guy that worked at Area 51 who lives in Hardy. Yeah, it only took me eight years to talk him into yakking. But, uh, and there's a lady who's 114 years old who lives over there. I think she's the 12th oldest person in the world now, something like that. Yeah, I interviewed her when she was 101, still lived on her own, and still drove her own car. She showed me a picture of herself when she was in nursing school in 1923. I did a story with her. I, I put anecdotes in there. She was born nine months after the airplane was invented. <laughs> she was born 39 years after Lincoln was assassinated. She, and uh, when her oldest son, who's pushing 90, was born, uh, Dracula starring Bela Lugosi <laughs> was the number one film. Yeah. She collected her first Social Security check the week that the Beatles started their tour, first tour, in the United States. She has lived, if you took all the presidents who lived from Washington to the day she was born in 1904, and then if you went from the day she was born to now, she has lived through 22 presidents. She's lived through half the presidents who've ever served. Yeah. I mean, she literally went from, I mean, she told me stories about going on dates, I mean, I told her, I saw this picture of her, and I was like, hey, Dorothy. Back when she was, she goes, oh, I know. <laughs> and I was like, man, you look pretty good back then. Um, but she told me stories about going on dates on, on horse-drawn buggies, and, like, that was all there was. There was no cars. Um, so, um, but anyway, and she showed me a postcard uh, from 1931. Her husband had said he'd sold $2 worth of marble in Chicago. She started crying right there. She goes, you don't even know what this meant to our family at that time. And you're talking about a woman who designed her own house. I mean, she obviously became very affluent later on in life. I mean, she'd been the, she'd seen the pyramids at Giza. She'd been to Greece. She'd been to Alaska. I mean, she showed me all these pictures. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of really interesting people that live, I mean, What's just right name? around here. What was her name? Her thinking? name is Dorothy Stinson. What, why, how'd she get over there? Hardy. She, um, she lived in Illinois. 
And then when she retired, she retired to Horseshoe Bend. And she designed her, her house was gorgeous. I mean, the house was immaculate. I took a picture of her. Um, and I actually see Grayson back there now, so I hate to say it. But, uh, like, she had this spiral staircase, and I stood on top of it, and she was holding a picture of herself to, from nursing school, and I took the shot from there. Um, but, yeah, she converted to Mormonism when she was 107. <laughs> yeah, she just, she's a hoot. I mean, I mean, I went in there and talked to her. Oh, no, I, I, guys, i got to tell you this. I'm sorry. I hate, I, if I'm born you to death, I can't. i got to tell you this part. So the first time I interviewed her, we're sitting there talking, and she immediately, like, her demeanor just changes. And I'm like, what's going on? There was a squirrel outside hopping around <laughs> on her deck. And, like, she got, gets up mid-sentence and just walks into a room. She comes out with this little sawed-off <laughs> shotgun. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> I saw that shotgun, and I'm like, son of a... I was like, I was about to do a barrel roll over this couch because I thought she just got dementia and didn't know where she was at. She, and she's a tiny little woman. I mean, she's maybe 4'10 at the most, probably weighed 80 pounds. She cocked that gun on her hip and she shoots this buckshot that comes out and just blows the squirrel's like tail to pieces. And it, the whatever left of it runs off. Well, I'm sitting there, I'm like, okay. It's pretty weird. She goes in there, puts a gun up, and I'm like, all right. So we're sitting there, and there's like pieces of the squirrel just on the deck. And it's really bothered me. So I was like, I said, Dorothy, if you got a broom, I'll sweep that off for you. And she's like, no, he's got a buddy that lives up there in that tree, and when he sees what happened to his little friend, <laughs> they'll understand that they're messing up the deck no more. And then right around this time, okay, so she tells me about her, or she tells me about her husband, the first one. And she could obviously tell that was the lover of her life. They were married for 60 or 50 something years. Well, then she starts talking about her other two husbands. Like one was about 10 years, and it was kind of one of those deals where his um, wife had passed, and you know, so they just got together. They were just more like traveling buddies. Now the third one, she really didn't like him at all. And um, I said, so what happened to him? Oh, she goes, oh, he's fine. He's he's at the nursing home. And I said. I said, well, why is he at the nursing home? And she goes, well, he's very immature. And, uh, she said, uh, I go, is there something wrong with him? She goes, no, he's fine. I just don't want him here anymore. So he's at the and her exact quote to me was, he's a pup. He was 94. <laughs> yeah. And then there was another, you know, like I tell that story, and a lot of people are like, okay, so what was her secret for living a long time? Well, I don't know what it was, but as we were talking, um, I kept hearing this really weird sound in her kitchen. It was like a fizzing sound. And she kept trying to act like she couldn't hear it. And I'm like, something going on in your kitchen. She goes, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm like, no, there's something fizzing in there. She goes, you promise not to tell anybody? I said, sure, Dorothy, I won't tell nobody. She opens up one of the cabinets, and there's this big, huge, like, glass jar with a balloon on top of it. <laughs> full of dandelions. She was fermenting dandelion wine. And I go, yeah, you're 101. I said, if you want to make some wine and drink it, that's great. And she goes, you really think so? I go, yeah. Well, then she starts opening up all of her cabinets. I mean, she had raspberries, blueberries. I mean, honey, she was fermenting everything in she did. She told me that she would drive to Illinois just to pick the right dandelion. So, anyway, she was a, that was a pretty interesting interview. And, um, and ironically enough, I interviewed, uh, you know, Carl Perkins, the 50s rock. Okay. Terry Hobbs, when he said that he was out, he said he was playing guitar with his al uh, alibi witness. He was playing riffs to the song Pretty Woman. Carl Perkins' son, Stan, is someone I've interviewed and I know real well. Um, he told me that he was sitting at home one day and Roy Orbison showed up at, at his dad's house. And he goes, i got to talk to your dad right now. And he goes, why? And he goes, I've just, I just came up with this song, and I really like it. So he said that Roy Orbison sat in their living room and started playing riffs to the song Pretty Woman. Oh. Yeah, so anyway, I, I don't know why I told you that. Roy Orbison Yeah. Breakout Yeah. I've done many stories about all these guys up and down this highway. Well, that's cool. 
I was going to tell everybody how interesting which is in West Memphis is, but after the Dorothy story, I think I don't have to sell that no. one anymore. <laughs> no. I'm, see, now I, I wrote these so that I can finally write that one. Because how do you, I mean, how do you explain to someone like a sentence or two, like why they should buy this book when that's, it's a fantastic story. And I'm going to write her. I've written several stories about her, and I'm going to write about her again. Because she'll probably outlive me. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else? That was wonderful. Yes. Thank you.